Chandler, Director of the Parent Education Series here in the Sequoia Union High School District. And I want to thank you and welcome you all for coming out tonight um, on this nice Thursday night. We have a really great event planned for you. I know people are going to kind of keep pouring in because we had a whole lot of people registered for tonight. And we have a wonderful presenter who, as I said in my promotional material, is backed by popular demand. Terry Ignatius, who is the college advisor here at Sequoia High School, is a big fan of Maria's and has seen her at national conferences. So we try to bring her back at least every other year because she has a lot of great information to share with you all. Um, so quickly, before I introduce tonight's presenter, I just wanted to say thank you, as always, to Sequoia's High School Education Foundation and the Sequoia Healthcare District and the Sequoia Union High School District, without whose support this program would not be possible. Um, we're also proud to report that tonight, last night, the program received a commendation from the superintendent of the Sequoia Union High School District. So after 14 years, that was a really great honor, and we are happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. A little round of applause for Karen. <laughs> All right, and there is some collateral from Maria's organization, Colleges That Change Lives. If you didn't pick it up as you came in, do get some as you're leaving. And also, you were hopefully handed a very short uh, survey. If you would fill out and hand in as you're going out tonight, this information helps us with reporting, grant funding, and information that we give back to the principals and the superintendent here at the district. Okay, here we go. Maria Furtado. Since 1988, nonprofit Colleges That Changed Lives has been a leading national advocate for keeping students at the center of the college search. Leading their efforts is Maria Furtado, Executive Director of Colleges That Change Lives. She speaks around the country to students, parents, and counselors about college rankings, popular misconceptions about college admission, and the strength and worth of a liberal arts education. Ms. Furtado believes that finding the right college should be about fit, not just settling or chasing a name brand. She feels that it is okay and actually preferable to enjoy talking about colleges and that the search itself should actually be fun. So remember that, parents, when you're working with your kids this fall, it's fun, okay? Um, having previously worked for two CTCL colleges, Maria now devotes herself full-time to the Colleges That Change Lives mission, helping students and families better understand the college admission process to find the best co possible college fit for their student. So please join me in a very warm welcome for Maria Furtado. I'll hobble up, you hobble down. But thank you. Thank you very much. One of the things I noticed already this evening is that no one sat in the very front row. And I was thinking of this program we did years ago. My friend Marty and I were presenting. And no one sat in the front row. We had a full house except for the very front row. So Marty got up and she said, you know, it's really interesting that no one sat in the front row. And it's too bad. She said, because under this chair right here, we taped a full tuition scholarship. <laughs> now, this is an absolutely true story. A mom got up from the back of the room. And she ran down the aisle at full speed. And she threw herself into the chair where the scholarship was theoretically taped. Now, I saw this out of the corner of my eye because I was actually watching her child who was in the back of the room. And this is all I could see from the child. <laughs> and in some ways, I think that is absolutely indicative of the college search. There's a point at which parents are much more excited about this than their students, and perhaps much more anxious about this than their students. Eventually, everybody tends to catch up and be kind of on that same um, same level of engagement, that same level of excitement. But there, there, is, there are stages to this. And when you're more excited, when they're more excited, when you're more anxious, they're more anxious. Um, what I want to do is give you some of what I hope will help it feel less anxiety-filled. Because this search truly is a good, it's a good experience for so many people because they allow it to be. And they don't allow the experience, they don't allow the search to run them and to run their family. They actually turn and run the search. They're the ones who really take, take hold of it. And they are true to themselves in the search. What happens too often is we, because we are a very good consumer culture, we get very excited about that which we know, and we get very frightened about things which we don't know. 
So I'm going to give you a series tonight, a few different uh, sort of odd, odd metaphor stories or perhaps tacky analogy stories. They might be a combination. But I have a friend whose parents years ago bought stock. They had come into a little bit of money, and they wanted to find a way to invest this money that would really help them in the long run. They had five kids that they hoped to send to college. And so they did a bunch of research into a company that was relatively new to the US. And they looked at the management, they looked at the product, they looked at the staffing, they looked at their, their forward projections and their financials, and they really sunk a lot of money into this company that they thought was going to do well, even though not a lot of people around them knew about it yet. And so with that stock that they took a chance on in Toyota, they sent five kids to college. They sent three on for MBAs, one's a lawyer, one's a doctor. Actually, two on for MBAs, one's a PhD, one's a lawyer, one's a doctor. And they really were able to take the time to think about this company in a way that helped them understand that it had a future and it had the potential to do what they needed. And even though it feels sort of like a tacky analogy, it really makes sense when you think about the college search. Because what are you looking at? You're looking at the management. So you're looking at how the institution is run, what are the kind of institutional goals? What are their academic goals? What are they trying to do big picture? You're looking at the, the people that make it happen. So you're looking at the faculty, the coaches, the student, the student leadership. You're looking at the student affairs leadership. And you're looking at the product, which is who do they produce as alumni? Who do they send out into the world? And what do they do with that education? So it's not a terrible analogy. It just feels a little bit tacky because we're going with cars and students. But that idea of, of taking the time, I think is really hard for us as a culture because we're busy. You've given a night to come and listen to talk about colleges. But we are busy. And so that's why rankings become so popular because we have a lot to do. So what do we do when we have a lot to do? We look for not shortcuts, but quicker answers. We won't call them shortcuts because that feels a little bit like we're cheating it, because I don't think we are. But we're trying to find information that's been vetted for us. And that works in some ways, and in some ways it doesn't. A, a ranking system only works for your family. If you have the same exact values as that ranking system, and you have them in the same ratio as that ranking system. So the big daddy is always US News and World Report. And they look at certain pieces of information. And you have to look at those and say, are these same pieces of information important to me, to my child's search, to how our family thinks about education, how our family thinks about the excitement of going forward and learning new and different things? If it is, if it's a perfect match, it's a perfect ranking for you. If only two criteria are important to you, then it's only a 20% fit as a ranking system for you. So it's still a useful tool. But it's like that thing where they say, you know, if everything is, um, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you don't want it to be the one and only tool. There has to be other things that you look at. They have to be the qualitative and the quantitative. It's one of the reasons that we love SAT scores. SAT scores are easy to measure. Either they're bigger or smaller. And so it sort of feels quick and dirty and easy. And because that's bigger, it's better, it's smaller. Small, not as good unless you're golfing. It's one of the few things where it goes the other way. But ask someone to sit and talk about a liberal arts education, to ask about you know, what do you want your philosophy of education to be within your family? How do you want to talk about this with your children? How do you want them to go forth and make change in the world? That takes a longer time. And we have to commit to it in a different way. And that's what we ask you to do when we talk about it at Colleges That Change Lives. We want you to think about this in a bigger way. So my job tonight is not to teach you about essays or when the deadlines are. I could, but you don't need me for that because you have good counseling for that. My idea for you is to think a little bit more about this philosophically. And let's step away from how do we get the nuts and bolts done, but even almost step back and say, why are we doing this? You know, it's easy for us to say, well, my, my child should go to college. I'm a first generation college kid. My parents did not go to college, but we always talked about it like I was going to go. 
And it was a very comforting feeling. We had no idea what to do. And so we followed people, in essence. We followed the families whose kids, you know, the people I knew in school that I knew their parents went to college, we followed them. Oh, it's a college fair? We should go to a college fair. They're going to the college fair. Let's go to the college fair. But we never really stepped back and asked why. And I think that's a big question, and it's a hard question, because you don't want to plant that seed of doubt with your child. It's like some families, when they start to talk about a gap year, the student comes home and says, you know, I could do a gap year. I could do all these really cool things after high school and take a year off and then go to college, and the parents' eyes get really big and a little bit frightened. And they think, well, if they don't go right away, will they, will they go? Because what are you used to doing? Making sure they go to the next step, go to the next step, go to the next step. And you're always the one that's right there to take them to that next step, that next step. And I'm not saying gap year is a right step versus wrong. I'm not saying college is a right step versus wrong. All I'm saying is that it's important to think about it in a bigger way, not just drive through and try to listen to what your kids say because they're so communicative. <laughs> you know, and one day they're going to sit down at dinner and say, you know, I've really been thinking about how I learn and the kind of community I want to be with. But you can hear the little bits and pieces here and there. You can hear, maybe not directly when they talk to you, but if you happen to be on carpool and they're in the back. This is one one of my friends did. Is she said, I put NPR on in the front because I knew they didn't really want to listen to that, but I wanted them to hear it anyway. She said, but I had it just low enough that I could hear it and hear what was going on in the back. And she said she got so much information because they would talk about what they liked in a class and what they didn't. And what you're trying to then do as the parent is try to help them suss that out and figure out what it is that they really are looking for. Because the first thing it's easy to say is, oh, I want to go where, well, well, I know it. I know it, you know it. We love the ooh factor. Oh, oh, oh. So how I think about it. Your child makes a college list. You go off to a conference maybe, or you meet some people you knew in high school. Oh, you have a junior, you have a senior. Oh, where are they looking? And you give them the list and they go, oh. <laughs> but what you worry about is them coming to you with them, you give them that list and they go, oh, really? And they have you, maybe you have two or three schools on that list that your student is really interested in that people might not know as well. And that's your perfect time to become the cheerleader. Learn three things about that school. Three things that you would find that you could give out as information. You become an advocate, you become a stronger advocate for your child, not just for the school, but for your child, and you build confidence, bless you, you, become, you build confidence each time you remind somebody or teach somebody about that institution. So I worked at Clark University, which is in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I worked at St. Petersburg, uh, sorry, Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. And it was fun because I could do those three facts. So if there was someone looking at Clark who didn't really know a lot, you could say things like, gosh, they have one of the best psychology programs in the country. It's the only place Freud spoke in the US. That was it, the only place. They have an amazing geography program. And then your friends are going, huh? I'm going to go, huh? But geography is incredibly important when it comes to marketing and it comes to, it becomes um, so important when we think about how our cities and suburbs grow. Great program. And they have a five-year program where a student can get a bachelor's and a master's in five years and the fifth year's tuition free. So you put all that together and that, huh, is going to become a, oh. And now you've got an extra O oh, and you've advocated. You have helped support your student's interest in a place that might be a little less traditional, might not be a place that everybody knows. This is an interesting place to live. We are not really smack dab in the middle, but we'll go with sort of off-center middle to one of the most selective, and I'm pointing that way and I have no idea if that's right, um, one of the most selective private institutions and one of the most selective public. So that was Berkeley, that was um, Stanford, just in case you're wondering, and I have no idea, again, if I pointed the right way. But we're right in this, uh, this crazy zone between these two places, and it's too easy, it's too easy for us all to get wrapped up in that name. But there has to be the question of, is it right for my child? Not just, is it right? Is it good? Yeah, it's good if they're good institutions, but are they good for that student? 
So I mentioned I worked at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. Eckerd has an amazing marine science program. It's what they're mostly known for. Marine bio, marine chem, marine geography, marine geophysics, great programs. It is also from the marine science facility here to maybe that wall, ocean, or bay, technically bay water. So we are this far from the bay. So you could look at a great school in the Midwest or in the upper Midwest, and you could look at a great school. Great school, that's a great school. If your child wants to do marine science, we don't keep the oceans in the Midwest. We keep them on the coasts. And so trying to hammer that, that, that marine kid, that marine science kid, into that great school in the Midwest is not going to work. So it's too easy for us to get wrapped up in that good school piece. What you need to do is dig a little bit deeper. And so I want to just do a little bit about what the media says, because I always find that interesting. So the media makes it seem, in some ways, like no one gets in anywhere. Because the articles will all come out, and it'll be, you know, amazing student, over a 4.0 GPA with the weighting, great test scores, took all the APs at their school, and then created an AP, and offered it to other students <laughs> at their school. And we'll go on to say that everybody loved them. Cats, dogs, because they started an animal shelter. Everybody loved them. But they were not admitted to any colleges. And I think of this as the dramatic and scary article. Americans love things that frighten us. So we like roller coasters, scary movies, and articles about college admission. It's all kind of right in there the same. But these articles will happen. And you go on to read because you think to yourself, oh my goodness, that is not my child, or oh my goodness, that is my child. What's going to happen to my child? But the reality is that that's very rare. And it's very rare for students who are willing to create a comprehensive list, not just a list that is name brand institutions they know, but a comprehensive list of schools that make sense for them for that individual human being, not for every individual human being in their school, but for that individual human being. And the reality is that of the 2,700 plus four-year four colleges in this country, so there's over 2,700 four-year colleges, nonprofits, public and private, 17 colleges, one seven, admitted less than 10%. So we're talking about 17 of almost 2,800 admitting less than 10%. And if we go wild and crazy, and we go all the way up to 20%, now you're talking about 17 plus 29. So you're still talking about a tiny number of schools and a very small percentage of students that apply to them. So when you read those articles, you have to recognize that you are often reading about the same small subset of institutions. You're not reading about the broad range of schools. You're reading about a small subset. Now, there's some of you in the room, and I absolutely know this is happening, who are thinking, well, I have a very smart child. I have a very capable child. I have a very ambitious child. Or you may be that very capable, very smart, ambitious student. That's fine. And you decide, well, they really should apply to those very selective institutions. That's also fine. Do your due diligence. And by that, I mean ask them the same hard questions. Either the, ask the rep, look at the website, whatever it might be. But ask the same hard questions that you would ask of a school you don't know. Because what happens is we assume we know the answers, and we don't always know the answers. So three things I would ask. These are three first things I would ask. Number one, who teaches? And then number 1B, so number 1A, who teaches? And number 1B, who teaches intro classes? Because I think that's incredibly important to find out. There is research that shows that students who connect to an adult on campus, typically faculty, but it could be a coach, it could be um, someone in the internship office, it could be someone they work with in an office at a, at a work study job, doesn't matter. If they connect to an adult, they are much more likely to persist. And so that's a really important thing to think about. Who teaches, who teaches intro classes? What can sometimes happen is we get very excited about a famous faculty person at a particular institution. Oh, do you know so-and-so teaches there? That's great. Find out who so-and-so teaches. 
Because if all they do is work with graduate students and they don't teach undergrads, that's not who you're sending off to school right now. That's not who's going to interact with them. So if they only teach grad students, then they're not really going to interact with your student. They're just going to be a person in the distance. So who teaches, who teaches intro classes? Second thing I would ask, and this only works if you have an idea or your student has an idea what they want to do, and I'm going to address that in a second. So I would ask, what did they teach? So if you have a student who loves biology, and they're really, really into frogs and fish, and you look at the classes in that biology department, and there's almost nothing having to do with frogs and fish, is that going to be an interesting department for that student for four years? Perhaps not. It's the same on the history side. If you have a history person who absolutely loves Civil War American history, and you can see that they teach one class in Civil War history, or you know, pre-Civil War, the war years, and one in Reconstruction, and that's all in their US history department that really has a lot to do with Civil War history, is that going to be enriching and fulfilling over four years? Probably not. So looking at those courses can be incredibly helpful if your student knows what they want to do. So I want to frame that. How many of you here tonight knew when you were 17 years old what you wanted to do for a living? And it's the only thing you have done until today. One, two, three, four. A couple are hesitant. They're not sure. So we'll go with five. We'll give the hesitants. We'll squash them together and make one. So five. And how many parents are still hoping they can figure out what they'd like to be when they grow up? Yeah, that's a lot more than five. So what happens is kids get to be juniors. And this almost happens literally after the sophomore year. Sophomore year ends on Tuesday. Wednesday, they're juniors, and everybody wills. What do you want to be? You're a junior. <laughs> and I think it's amazing. They didn't have to know yesterday. But today, they need to know. So if you can try not to do that, not to try to pin them down, because what are they going to do? when you try to pin them down. Well, what do you want to be? What are you going to do when you grow up? What do you want to go to school for? What are you going to be? And I think what happens is, I know what happened to me, you pick very tangible things. Doctor, lawyer, teacher, entrepreneur, uh, want to go into business, uh, uh, math. And then they run, as well they should. Now, I wanted to be a lawyer from when I was nine until I was 19. And I did two internships in the law, and I decided it was not right for me. No offense to any attorneys in the room. It's just not right for me. But I think that we pinpoint them so quickly that we don't give them a little bit of freedom. And then part of you says, well, if I'm giving them all this freedom, I'm also giving them a lot of money to go and do this freedom. I get that. I get that, partially because we just did the kindergarten search, which is freakishly like the high school and college search. <laughs> Very strange. But I think that if we can give them the time if we think about the people in our lives who love what they do, did they know what they wanted to do forever? Or did they figure it out as they went along and find something totally unexpected as they went forward? Um, maybe in college, maybe after college, they took that first job just to test it out, and then ah, this, was, this was it. This is what they really wanted to do. Or they were always thinking medicine, 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 medicine. But what they realized is they really want community medicine. And they want to be on the education side of medicine. And so giving them a little bit of that freedom is incredibly helpful in this search. And part of me, after 25 years in this business, part of me wants my son to grow up and say, you know, I'd really love to do library science. And the school has to have ultimate Frisbee. Because it's going to take 2,700 colleges and bring it down to about four. And our search will be super simple. But I don't think it's going to happen. But just so you know, I harbor that same hope. So who teaches? What do they teach? Who teaches? Who teaches intro classes? What do they teach? And then the last thing I think is really important is, will they find their people? Will they find their next group of good, solid friends? Because that's part of what that makes that experience amazing. You know, I went to a college that, that didn't fit me very well, but it served me very well. I got an, a good education, but I met some amazing people. And that's where, where the reality is of how much the people make a difference. That's why every rep you meet will encourage you to visit the campus. They really want you to visit the campus. I'm going to touch on that again at the very end. But I think that understanding if you can find your people 
is very, very helpful. So if a student is really interested in theater, they may not want to be a theater major, but they love theater. Look at what they do. What shows have they done? What, what improv groups do they have? What's local that you could hit the theater and go to the theater and see things? Will that, will that need be refreshed? And will they meet people with common interests? Is community service incredibly important? If it is, how do they talk about it? How do they talk about it as part of campus? How do they talk about it in their interest in seeing it in admission, or do they not? And that's OK either way. You know, it, the more specific the interest, in some ways, the easier it gets. But there's, there's a feeling that kids will get sometimes when they hear about an institution, um, often when they visit an institution, that really gives them a sense that this is a place that makes sense for them. And that's the schools you want on the list. Um, there's a woman named Barbara Connor who does college admission in Virginia, not college admission, college counseling in Virginia, and she calls it five first choices. And that's what she encourages the girls at her school to do, is find five first choices. Um, and really think about those places that would be a great place to be, whether they're admitted to all five or admitted to just one, they put themselves in a position of really being comfortable because they have those five first choices. So those are the first things I would think about. Again, who teaches, who teaches intro classes? What do they teach? And will they find their people? Because that's where you start to see the successes. That's where you start to see students come back after that first year, super excited to go back for the second year, and ready to stay and persist and become part of that alumni body. Because those connections that they make are valid. And, and oftentimes, people think, well, it has to be a big school for those alumni connections to really matter. And I would disagree. I think, especially for two examples within our group of colleges. So Wabash College is a men's college in Indiana, and Agnes Scott is a women's college in Atlanta, or just outside Atlanta. Their alumni bodies love their institutions so much. They are so connected, and they will connect an alumnus or alumna from those institutions to internships, to job opportunities, to travel opportunities, to recreational opportunities in a heartbeat. We, would, we have alumni come to help at our programs when we travel around the country. And those Wabash guys, they just love their institutions so much. And the same with the Agnes Scott women. Um, it doesn't have to be a single sex school for this example to work. They just happen to be the two that I picked tonight. But they are, um, these institutions generate from their, their alumni, they generate great love. They really do. And the faculty connections that they make are really intense and really valuable. When I worked at Clark, there was a young man who worked in our office for four years as an undergrad. He stayed to do his master's. He worked for us for five years in our office. And he was working on a project and brought the proposal to his faculty person at Clark. And they said, you know, this is really interesting. I know a bunch of faculty who are working on this um, in the Harvard Forest, which is out near um, Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. So he said, let's go. And John was kind of like, let's go where? He said, let's go. We're going to go meet them. And he literally took John in his car and drove him to meet these other faculty that were working from other institutions that he could get involved in that research project. And that kind of connection is easier, I think, at institutions that are focused on undergrads. So all of our institutions are very much focused on undergrads. We have 45 member schools and colleges that change lives. Um, they are all very focused on undergrads. Many of them have master's programs or PhDs. A couple have law schools. Um, they have connections to med schools. But they are very focused on that undergrad education. And that's the group that you are looking for. We had a super faculty person at Eckerd College. He was a really good mentor. He was a great teacher for 18 to 22 year olds. He didn't love it at all, at all. It was not his area of interest. So he left and he went to a large research institution where he only works with grad students on research. And he's a much happier professor because that's a much better place for him. But the people who stay, at small liberal arts colleges stay because they love to teach. We were doing a program one day, uh, one day for admitted students, and our president at Eckerd would do kind of a state of the union, talk about the institution, what was happening, what was coming, the financials, and then he would take questions. And so a dad got the microphone one morning, and his question was, so the people who teach here, you know, your faculty, the ones who teach here, he said, is it because they can't get jobs at real colleges? like research universities. 
I have never seen faculty want to get to a microphone that fast. The reason they are there is because they love to teach and they love to mentor. And again, when you look at that research that says if, if students make connections, that they are much more likely to persist. That's where it becomes important, I think. I'd like to say three things about liberal arts education. I like to say them out loud because I think they're important to say no matter where I go, no matter how sophisticated I think the audience might be. So number one, just a, a quick rundown on liberal arts education, because many of us are familiar with the term but don't always know what it means, or we think we do, we might not. Um, basically, a student is going to have a home department, and they're going to be pushed out into other departments. So the scientists are going to take arts classes, the artists are going to take science classes, the mathematicians are going to take social science classes, those social science people are going to go into the arts. So everybody's going to be moved out of their own home base periodically for some number of courses, typically a third, a third, a third, a third in the liberal arts, a third in your department, and a third of electives. But the idea is that it teaches them to see connections in better ways and it directly relates to what employers look for, that ability to see connections. The second thing I'd like to say is that liberal arts education is not just for liberals. <laughs> it's actually a pretty big misconception. And within our group of colleges, I can lead you toward the liberal end, I can teach you toward, lead you toward the conservative end without any trouble. We have a full range of schools. And then the third thing that I think is important to remember is that a liberal arts education includes science, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, biochem, computer science, environmental science, and it can include engineering. But lots of times it's presented as two separate things, the, the sciences over here and the humanities and the social sciences and the arts over here. And, and it's like there's a dividing line. There's no dividing line at this kind of campus at this kind of education. There is a mix, and you're always going to be nudged, again, in and out of departments where you are more comfortable academically, or where your student is more comfortable academically. And the reason is that it stirs up the brain in a different way. Charlene worked in our office, again, for five years. She stayed and did her master's in uh, genetic research when she was at Clark. And she, she was a great student, loved science, still does science for a living. So like every good student, she left the most difficult, she perceived to be most difficult course till the end. So second semester senior, she finally figured out she needed to fill her arts perspective. And so she took a course called Creative Actor. And it was the only time I've ever heard anybody say that they were very confident that their organic chemistry grade was going to bring up their other grade. Because that doesn't, it's just not that conversation very much. So it was really fun to watch her take Creative Actor, not so much as I was in the classroom, but when she came back and talked about it. Because she would talk about how they asked her to do so many different things with her body in that class, and to approach things intellectually in such a different way, that when she went back to the lab, she actually looked at things differently. And she saw a different perspective. And she found it incredibly helpful, and she was shocked to be fair. She was very shocked. And I was talking to this young man at a college fair one night, and he said, you know, I, I, I want to go into theater. He said, I, that's all I want to do is go into theater. Why should I take a science class? He said, why would I take chemistry? I said, well, let's say you go to your very first audition. It's your very first audition. You're very excited. And they say, they pull back a curtain and they say, here's a lab. The role is chemist. Show us what you can do. And if you've never been in a lab, what are you going to do? If you've never had that extra experience. And he kind of looked at me as if to say, that was mean. That was sort of his look, that was mean. It was a mean example. But it was a really true example. You don't know yet where things are going to lead. And you don't know what connections are going to make the most sense. And that liberal arts education can really, really lead to lead students in a way that brings them to places they don't expect um, or brings them where they hope to be, either way. I read a lot of articles about what employers are looking for. And because we all want our kids to get jobs. I want my little library scientist, um, my, my librarian who's playing Ultimate Frisbee, I want him to ultimately get a job. He's only five. He's got time. But I want him to get a job at some point. 
And so we all want that for our kids. But we want them to also be fulfilled in that work, I think, I hope. So it's really interesting to see what employers say they're looking for, especially in young employees. And these articles that I read day after day will typically say that they are looking for the following skill set. The ability to think well, think critically, think creatively. They will teach somebody an industry, but they don't want to teach them how to be a good thinker. They want them to come with that. They will talk about how they want them to communicate well in writing, the old-fashioned writing, in writing and in person. They will talk about the ability to work with someone not like them, someone who approaches a question or perspective in a different way. And that, I think, is where it's very helpful to be the scientist pushed out into the arts class or the artist asked, asked to look in that microscope and see what you see. Because then you're working with people who have different ways of approaching the same question. Employers will say they want people who can analyze data, who can see interesting patterns and trends that someone else might not see. And they will say that they are looking for creative problem solvers. This skill set comes up over and over and over again. From the tech industry to STEM to artists to teachers, lawyers, doctors, all of it, all of it. One of my favorite experiences in meeting with kids over the years is I would talk about why I thought a liberal arts education was so great for people who might be looking at medical school or going into the medical field. And they'd say, you know, they'd be very kind. And we would talk through the whole conversation. The student would nod politely. And then at the end, I'd say, does that make sense? And they'd say, well, sort of, you know, but I'm going to go into veterinary medicine. So I'm not actually going to work with people. I'm going to work with animals. I said, really? My dog does not drive himself to the vet. I said, he doesn't pay the bill. I said, what if you have colleagues? What if you're not the only person in your vet practice? You have vet techs, you have other vets. What about that ability to interact with everybody else? And their eyes would get really huge. And they'd say, oh, I didn't even think about that. What we're doing as a country in some ways is a disservice to a huge piece of the skill set that we all need because we call it soft skills. And soft skills makes it seem less important. But that ability to understand another's perspective, that ability to see a different way of answering the question, to see connections that someone else doesn't see, that skill set is incredibly sought after. And there is some research, for sure, that shows that science people, when they get in that, to that first job, they make a little bit more money starting out. But there's research that also shows that when we get to that big, big earnings period, so in your 40s and 50s when you're typically earning the most, the humanities people have creeped up and moved ahead in average salary because they have a bigger skill set and they're more able oftentimes to move up into management in different ways. So that ability to, to have a broad education with a specialization is really an effective way. And it takes our students to places that we don't know yet. Where are they going to go? What's going to be next? All of us in this room, yeah, all of us in this room can probably remember having a phone at home attached to the wall, right? And if you were lucky, it had a long cord so you could go around the corner and your parents couldn't hear you. If you were at my house, we did not have that long cord. Think about how much has changed in the very short time since we were using those phones and to the phones we all have in our pockets today and how much has changed in what we do. How many of you wanted to be web designers when you were in high school? And anybody want to be a, an internet entrepreneur? And who wanted to be in social media and social marketing? It wasn't there. And again, it's not that long ago. It just feels that long ago some days. When I worked at Eckerd, there was um, an article that came out. Uh, the governor at the time made the comment that he thought really everybody should go into STEM because who needs anthropology majors? I live with an anthropology major. So it was an ugly night at my house to start with. But then about two weeks later, there was an amazing article that came out 
about people who do social, social media and social marketing, uh, advertising in general, and that they were actively recruiting anthropology majors because they understand a lot about how people move through their culture and how people work in small group and large group and how things shift over time. And they're really good at seeing data and patterns of data that others don't see. And so I felt like anthropologists everywhere had been you know, sort of um, brought to the forefront and, and given this great, great pedestal to stand on. And I really wanted to send the article to the governor in Florida, but I was pretty confident that he didn't care. So I've just kind of hung on to that article as I think really helpful. The other one, the other one point I want to make about the liberal arts is I think that um, we tend to dismiss it on the science side because we think that people need the research university to do the science. And I have not found that to be the case. I did a presentation this summer with a chemistry professor, and he was telling me about some research that came out about the medical school search and what medical schools look at. And they look at the things you would expect, grades, courses, MCAT score. They look at discipline records from college to see if the students have been in trouble or not in trouble. But one of the biggest things they look at, and one of the probably, I think he said, the number one influencer on medical school admission is did the student have a chance to do research in college? And did they do significant research? Did they maybe publish some research while they were in college? The kinds of schools that I work with, liberal arts colleges in general, have great opportunities for students to do that because there's not a graduate school level in the way at most of these institutions. So it's back to our, my former colleague from Eckerd who was you know, off to work with graduate students at a big research institution, and they were getting the big opportunities. There was a young man who graduated from Hendricks College, which is in Arkansas, and he went off to the University of Arkansas Health Sciences to do an MD-PhD program. And in his first semester as a graduate student, he was the first lead author on a published paper. And the reason was that his research at the grad level was directly resulting from the research he had done for four years at Hendricks. And so he was really able to just step right forward and continue on the work that he was doing. When I visited her sinus college, which is just outside Philadelphia, my tour guide was a second semester senior and she was a science major. And so I asked, I said, you know, did you have a chance to do research while you were here? Has that been part of your experience? And she said, I've been on the same research team for four years. She said, I've published. She said, I've had so many opportunities because I got in early. She said, and I just went and talked to a professor who was doing a project that sounded interesting. And you can do that when that professor has 25 people in their intro class, not 250 or 500 people, but 25 people in the intro class. And they're teaching the intro class. And so she went off from her sinus to Princeton, where she did an, uh, a master's and PhD in chemistry, and Princeton paid. So there's that worry that schools won't know, colleges or universities won't know, um, that's not true, grad schools, that's what I'm trying to say, will not know about some of these smaller institutions. And in some ways, I think that's a fascinating a fascinating intellectual ego that we all have. Well, if I don't know about it, who could? Isn't that a fun way to go through the world with great confidence like that? If I don't know it, well, who could? Why would a med school or law school or grad school know it if I don't know it? And I, I really do applaud that kind of intellectual confidence. Juniata College. Who'd heard of Juniata College till I just said it out loud? One, two, three, that's pretty good. Four? Four. That's pretty good in a California crowd. I don't usually get that many. Juniata College is a small school in the middle of Pennsylvania in a small town. Med schools love their kids. They love their kids. They get in at incredibly high rates because they're so prepared and they've seen their successes. Earlham College in Indiana has a, there's a science firm in Indianapolis who looks for their students to come and intern for them because they are more prepared than most of the graduate students that they come, that come to intern for them. They have better lab skills. They are more prepared than most of the grad school students that they get. So this kind of institution can prepare students incredibly well. You may not know it, but lots of people do. 
And so what I find really interesting is to watch families. So I'll watch them at a program, and they'll be out in the front waiting for the program to start. And they'll say things to their kids like, you know, this is going to be so exciting when you go off to college. You're going to meet new people. You'll go new places. You might live in a different part of the country. You might, you might study abroad and go even further. You'll just see so much that's new and different. And isn't that exciting? And then they walk into the college fair with their child. And they get in front of a table that they don't know, of a school they don't know. And the child starts to go toward the table. And the parent will push them, literally push them away. No, no, honey, we don't know that one. So in the hallway, we were excited about all the new and different things. But in the college fair, no, no, we don't know that one. And it's such a weird mixed message. There are so many institutions out there that do such a good job. All I would ask you to do is be willing to look. If you go to a college fair with your child and they look at a brochure, they've not deposited. If you look at the website, you walk in and they're looking at a website in the schools in New England, they've not deposited. If they apply, they've not deposited. If they're admitted, they've not deposited. All these are is steps along the way. Give them the freedom to think about it. When I used to come out to recruit, I always recruited in California. It was always part of my territory. And so I was doing a program in San Diego one time at a very good school in San Diego, good high school. And I said to the crowd, I said, OK, I want you to think a little more broadly. I want you to think outside California. I said, how many states are there? <laughs> and there was this great silence for a really long time. And if you have the microphone, the silence can be as long as you want it to be. And so it was just to that part where it was really awkward and uncomfortable for everybody. And a small voice at the back of the room said, 60? <laughs> and in some ways, that's the California thing. We have all the things we need. We have forest. We have mountains. We have beaches. We have urban. We have rural. We have farm country. We have LA. We have all the things that we think we need. But that's a big world out there. It's like when I ask people to look at schools in the Midwest, and they're kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. And I would come and recruit for Eckerd. And when you work for a college, you go to the places where you think you'll be successful. You don't go to places where you think you will not be successful. It doesn't make any sense. So I would talk to a family, and they would love all these things that they would hear about Eckerd College. And then they would lean over, and they would always whisper. And I never got this part, but they would whisper. They'd go, but it's in the South. And I would say, well, you don't have to whisper, because I know it's in the South. I, I live right down the street. I know. And if you're from the South, Florida is not considered the South. I live with someone from Tennessee. It's considered the occupied territory, <laughs> not the South. I'd say, but you know, we don't have to whisper. And you have to remember that there's a lot that's similar in a state of like Florida and a state like California. And they would look at me like I had lost my mind. So I would draw them a terrible map of Florida. So it would you know, kind of go like this, and then it would have dots at the bottom, because I love the keys, so I would always add the keys in. And I would say, you know, here's the blue parts, Tampa, St. Pete, where Eckerd was, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, maybe Jacksonville, kind of a purplish. And a whole lot of the state was red, no question. And then I would draw them a terrible picture of California. And I would do the same thing. Here we are, you know, Sonoma County, down through Silicon Valley. And then, or maybe all the way down to LA, but not Orange County. And then the red, the inside part of the state the Modesto, the Bakersfield. I said, these states are not that different. You have to look at the institution. You have to look at the city it's in. And you have to recognize that each of these places has their own personality. And all I want you to do, really, is open your minds and not be frightened of it. Give it a chance. Take a peek. If ultimately your kids stay in California, I get it. No question. If ultimately they go and come back, that is very common. 
There's a young woman that I uh, recruited from Gunn High School who came back. She came to Clark, she came back. Now I will tell you my other story that will scare you at the beginning, but don't be afraid, wait till the end. I got an email from a mom from Jefferson, Oregon. She said, Jefferson, Oregon has 2,500 people. I have no idea how my daughter has found your school 3,000 miles away, but she loves it and she wants to apply early decision and these are my concerns. And so one of her big concerns was that Brennan would go and not come back. And I said, you know, what happens is a lot of times students will come, they have a chance to experience a different part of the country, and then they come back, and it's okay. So I worked with the family all the way through. Brennan did apply early decision. She did come. She stayed. She did the five-year program in education. That was great. Tamara, that was her mom, was okay with that. While she was at, at Clark, she studied abroad in Morocco and met a Moroccan. And so she graduated in Worcester, Massachusetts and moved to Morocco. And I was a little afraid to run into her mom. <laughs> I, I admit that. But she stayed. I happen to keep track of them this way and that way. She stayed in Morocco for about three years. And she ultimately now lives you know, 25 miles from her mom in Jefferson, Oregon. So there was a big circle where she came back. But what I really appreciated about the Mannings, um, about the family, was that they, they gave her the opportunity to look and to at least think about it. Because that's half the battle. Whether they go, whether they stay. That's still half the battle, because you've at least explored it. And there's not that, well, I wish I had thought about. I could have looked at. Why didn't I? Because you gave them that opportunity. And that can pull back on some of those, those difficult conversations where you feel like you're, you're always reining them in, and they feel like they're always trying to pull away. And maybe bring that back to more of a common ground where you're both talking about possibilities. And that's a way to think about this search in a different way. There was some really interesting research that came out a few years ago that I want to share. Because my board asked me if I could think about a way to talk about the financial commitment of college admission or the college process. Um, and I couldn't figure out a way to talk about 45 colleges' financial aid policies. Because I thought that was just that's, that's too big. So I tried to think about it a different way. And I remembered some research that came out a few years ago. And it was called the Gallup-Purdue Index. And what they did was they surveyed 30,000 people who had a bachelor's degree, who lived in the US, and had access to the internet. So it was a pretty big swath of people. And they asked them a series of questions about their college experience and about their lives at that point in time. And so it very quickly in our business became called the Happiness Index. But what they were asking them was about their personal and professional satisfaction, when the, day, like the day they took that survey. How did they feel about themselves as a person and as a professional? And I think this leads very nicely to that idea that we want our kids to be successful, but we haven't defined that. And we want them to be happy. And I think we can define that almost more easily. We want them to be happy personally and professionally. And we want them to move out. I know that. You're thinking that? I know that. We want them to move out. I get that part. So what they found was there were some statements about the college experience that correlated really highly to whether or not a person felt they were successful, whether they were happy, personally and professionally. And so these statements are those statements that correlated most with that idea of happiness and personal satisfaction. My professors cared about me as a person. I had a mentor who encouraged me to pursue my goals and dreams. I had at least one professor who made me excited about learning. I worked on a project that took a semester or more to complete, so some type of long-term research perhaps, or writing a play, doing a series of sculptures. I was active in extracurricular activities and organizations. I had an internship or job that allowed me to apply what I was learning in the classroom. If they agreed with these statements, they were much more likely to say, that their experience had been worthwhile. It had been worth the money, the tears, the sweat, all of it that comes with a college experience. That investment that you make as a family, that they make as a person. And what I thought was really interesting is the first four, I'm pointing at them like you can read them from there, but the first four are all about faculty connection. And so that's why I think asking about faculty makes a big difference and trying to understand what that faculty connection is to your student and which faculty they are working with. Is it faculty? Is it grad students? Who are they working with? 
And that is going to be so important to their experience. So I think that's where that comes in really handy. There's a lot that the media writes about this business that is inaccurate, or not inaccurate, but incomplete is probably a better way to look at it. So what do you think, this is your big chance, what do you think the average admission rate is for four-year colleges and universities in this country? So four-year nonprofit, public or private? 20%? 25? 45. I like the optimism of getting better. 65? OK. Anybody else? 10%. Right? There's always somebody. Usually it's a sad seven. And I know numbers don't have emotion, but I usually get one person. And they're all kind of curled up and go, seven. So 10, I've got 10, 20, 45, 65. Anybody else? 70. That's why I like that optimism. Because now you're thinking she keeps making us guess. I know how this works. Now, where's my 65? Over here. So if this was Price is Right, you would be right just about on target. I have no refrigerators, nothing to offer. But the average admission rate in this country is about 65%. And it has been for years. But the perception is very different. Because what gets written about? That narrow band of institutions is very selective. So if you read the articles and you notice that over and over and over again, they're writing about the same institutions, you just have to notice that and keep that in your mind as you read the articles. Now again, you may say, well, my student is one of those really, the kids that should be at one of those selective schools, and that's fine. What they find is, the research finds that students who could be or are admitted to the very selective institutions, but choose other institutions because they feel like a better fit, actually do really well because they were motivated, capable students. And they do super well at that institution. I worked with a guy who looked at two schools. He looked at MIT, and no offense to MIT grads, these are just examples. He looked at MIT and he looked at Eckerd. And he went to visit MIT and he said, everyone seemed super smart, but no one seemed happy. He said, I was there for a whole weekend, no one seemed happy. He said, and I went to visit Eckerd and so many people seemed happy. And they were smart. And he said, why would I pick one over the other? Why would I pick a place where people seemed unhappy? And he had a great experience. He did marine geophysics. He's got a PhD in geophysics. He's, you know, he was that kind of person. But he also had that confidence and he had his family support to make that kind of a decision. I worked with this great kid from Ventura and he was, his last two, he was down to UCLA and Eckerd. And he was very self-aware because he, he said, I'm really struggling. He said, my ego wants to accept UCLA. He said, my ego wants to go to UCLA. He said, but my, my, the rest of me wants to go to Eckerd. And it would, that's a hard thing to balance. Um, but he had a great experience at Eckerd. I was really happy that he chose it. And um, it's worked out really well. I'll, again, all I'm asking is that you are willing to open your minds a little bit to a different way of looking at this search and not getting caught up so quickly in that brand name. Um, there is a benefit to a small group of students um, if they do go to, the, to a a really big name institution, and it benefits most first generation students of color. Um, those students get the biggest socioeconomic bump out of going to a very selective institution or a very well-known institution. And it's, it's a great thing. That's a great, um, it's a great piece of information to have. Um, but I also remember that the very selective institutions are just that. And I don't want a student senior year to be focused on the negative possibilities. I want every student to go through their senior year thinking, I will have choices on April 1. And I want every student to be there on April 1 with choices, choices they feel good about. And that happens when you have a balanced list. So I have a couple more things I want to do. Actually, three, three things. I will stop talking eventually and take questions, I promise. And then I'll start talking again when you ask questions. Um, number one, I want to give you a little history about how colleges that changed lives came together, because you're wondering, you know, why? We came together because of a book called Colleges That Changed Lives. 
It was written by Lauren Pope. Lauren worked in higher ed. He was a newspaper writer at heart, though. And he worked for the New York Times for years, writing about education in the US. And he, he came to really love even more than he had before the liberal arts education in the US. And so he wrote about it a lot. And parents came to him and asked for guidance. And eventually, he started working with families. And he would advise them to look at small liberal arts colleges. And when people came back to him, students, parents, they would come back to him and say, this place changed my life. I feel like my life has been transformed. And by that, they meant they were better thinkers. They were better writers. They, they felt like they could communicate what they believed in more easily, more strongly. And they felt like they could argue with someone about what they believed in, in a, in a respectful but thoughtful way. And so that really, that gave him the title of the book. Because people wanted him to make a list. Can't you make us a list of good schools? And he said, no but I'll write a book. And so in his mid-80s, not the mid-80s, his mid-80s, he wrote a book called uh, Looking Beyond the Ivy League. And parents loved it, counselors loved it, and then they asked for a list. And he said, no, but I'll write another book. And that's when he wrote Colleges That Changed Lives. And he wrote it three times. He revised it twice after the original writing. Uh, when we started working together 20 plus years ago, uh, because we looked around a very smart person working at Beloit College looked around and said, these schools have commonality, but they have distinctiveness. And we could work together and really help students and parents do this search in a different way. And so we've been working together for 20 plus years. We started the nonprofit organization because Lauren was in his mid-90s the last time he worked on a book. We were fairly confident he wouldn't work on another one, but we wanted his message to continue forward. So he gave us his blessing to start the nonprofit, and that was about 15 years ago. And so our goals are to get people to think about this search a little bit differently, to keep it student-centered, for it to be about the student, not about the bumper sticker, not about the oohs and ahs from your friends and colleagues and family, but really about the student and where that student will thrive because they are supported and challenged. And to really get the word out about a liberal arts education, and certainly it helps each of the institutions, but none of the institutions have become crazy selective since we've been working together. That question comes up fairly often. We have 45 schools, 40 were profiled in the last book Lauren worked on himself, which was in 2006. In 2012, his family hired an author to revise the book, and she put in four schools, took out four schools. We invited those four schools to join us, and they did. And then in fall of 2018, Bard College joined our nonprofit. They were profiled in one of the earlier books. So all of our schools have been profiled in one or more of the Colleges That Changed Lives books. And their educational experience remains transformational for students. They do great work with so many students. Um, is it the right kind of institution for everybody? No. I don't mean that it is. Some people will thrive at the big schools. Some people will do really well if they do the community college to another step. And all of those are perfectly fine processes, perfectly fine paths to take. Um, but we feel like these schools and schools like them have something special to offer students. So that's our history. I want to give you three ways to think about bringing down stress within your family, just in case there's any stress in your family about the college search. That's really the only stress I can help with. Number one, I'd like to talk about your car. So like everywhere else, we have traffic. We get stuck in traffic. We sit in traffic. I was in traffic. And I finally get up to 10 miles an hour one day, and my door lock's locked. And when they locked that day, and they make that very distinctive noise, I had this, these two thoughts, one right after the other. And my first thought was, I bet parents hear that noise and they think, we're trapped in the car. We should talk about college. <laughs> and my second thought was, I bet kids hear that noise and they think, oh, we're trapped in the car. We're going to have to talk about college. So maybe, especially with the holidays coming, ski season, you can drive to Tahoe or Mammoth or something, maybe you make your car a college-free zone. Don't talk about it in the car. Think about how much more pleasant some of your rides might be. Second thing, if you use a calendar as a family, maybe you can add to your calendar, and I apologize for that suggestion, but maybe you can add to your calendar an hour on Sunday, college admission. And then it takes care of some of these scenarios. So the student gets up one morning and they have a test. 
And they're very focused on that test because it's that day. So it's a very immediate thing that's coming. I studied this, I studied that, I studied this, I wanted to check that, I should have checked this. And so they are very immediately focused, or very um, that day focused. And they come into the kitchen early in the morning and they bump into mom, who's been up since three, <laughs> drinking coffee since four, and think about that essay since five. And so mom is very future focused, and the student is very immediately focused, and that can put some real pressure in the kitchen. So if you have college admission on your calendar, it gives the student the permission to say, respectfully, I have a test today. Can we talk about it on Sunday? This is part of my wild and crazy idea that not every conversation you have as a family needs to be about college. You can talk about other things. And if you have younger children at home, they'll be thrilled if you talk about something else once in a while. OK? The third thing I would say, if possible, and I know that this has a financial commitment, and I recognize that. I'm not dismissive of it. If possible, visit the colleges on your list, on your students' list. Visit before you apply. If you can, that's great. If you can't visit after admission, that's fine. Um, but try to visit, because the reality is almost everybody has a beautiful website. And all the New England schools' brochures have foliage. <laughs> and all the schools in California have either the Golden Gate Bridge or the Hollywood sign or both. <laughs> and schools where it snows show very little snow. <laughs> we were working on brochures one summer at Clark. And there were kids, there were kids working in the office. And uh, we were talking about the brochures, and I said, why don't we put in a snow picture? And someone in the room actually gasped. You know how you read in a book, so-and-so gasped? Someone actually gasped. Like, ah! I said, what? We can't put a snow picture. I said, you know people know it snows in Massachusetts, right? And they're like, but we don't have to show them. Which I thought was fascinating. So everybody sends beautiful brochures. All the people are happy. If you visit, you get a much better sense of the institution. Is it the right place? You will some places walk on the campus and be stunned by how it fits. And other places, you'll walk onto that one that looked perfect on paper and perfect online, and your child will walk on campus and go, oh, no, 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 no. My friend left Connecticut with her daughter and her daughter's friend. They went to visit six schools. Both girls had the same school at number one when they left the house. And when they drove back in the driveway, their number one had become their number six. There's something about being there, if you can get there, that makes great sense. Um, that, that really helps. Now, these trips can be hard because you are thinking as parents, Maybe consciously, maybe not consciously. I could leave my child here one day. If it's been a hard trip, I could leave my child here today. That would be OK. <laughs> I've seen those family dynamics over the years. And students, whether they're thinking about it or not, are thinking, I could stay here one day. I could live here. This will be part of my identity. And we don't always say it out loud, but that is a lot of the dynamic that's happening. So these trips can be hard. Think of something you can do every day that is rest, restful or relaxing for your family. If you're hikers, bring boots. If you're yoga people, bring your mats. Find an open yoga studio. If you're theater people, find local theater. Go to a movie. Go to the woods. Go for ice cream. Whatever works for you as a family. I love independent bookstores. That's always my thing. I find them incredibly relaxing. I will also go to chain bookstores. I'll go to all the bookstores tonight at the airport to see if they have the same books. I am that person. I find it incredibly relaxing. Not everybody does. Whatever works for your family. The more you can go to each campus with a refreshed mind and, and a, a relaxed body, you will see the campus better for what it truly is and what it truly offers, whether it's a fit or not. It truly gives you a better sense. So try to think of a way that you can be a, as relaxed as you can be as you go campus to campus. Those three tips work for some families. They don't work for other families, and I get that. 
I really do. But if you can think about ways to not let this dominate your lives, it is a piece of your lives, absolutely. But please, don't let it be the only thing in your student's life. Because the reality is, we all go to high school once. Pretty much everybody that I've met goes to high school once. You go to high school once. We don't want it always to be about that next thing. Because then they go to college, and college all becomes about grad school or that next job. And then all we're doing is living that next piece, and we're not living the piece we're in. And that's not a good way for us to be. There's too many articles about 25 and 28-year-olds who are burned out. And we don't, I don't want our kids to be those kids, to be those young people. So when Charlene put the title on this, she put the good, the bad, and the OMG, right? So I'm going to hit the OMG for a minute, because I think this is probably a crowd that's been paying attention to the Varsity Blues FBI case. Just a little, right? So I want to ask you to do two things. Think about two things when it comes to that case, because I think that is kind of our biggest OMG lately. Number one, this was a small number of people in a very large industry, 2,700 four-year colleges, almost 4,000 schools when you add community colleges in this country. 4,000, 4,000. If everybody just had 10 staff in admission on average, that's 40,000. You talk about coaches, there's a lot of people. This was a very small number of bad actors. No pun intended, sorry. But these are a very small number of the people who made bad choices, who made bad decisions. This is not the whole industry. I have met so many incredibly ethical, incredibly kind people who will do everything they can to help you and your student get through this process, to understand the process, to figure out the financials, to figure it out. And they will guide you to their institution if it's the right place. And you'd be amazed how many will counsel a student away from their institution if it is not the right place for academic, financial, or personal reasons. If it's not the right place, they will counsel students away. This is a very ethical business. And that I, I hope you can take that away. The second thing I would ask you to think about is have we done this to ourselves as a culture? Have we decided as a culture that there are just a tiny number of good schools? And if that is the case, if there are just a tiny number, then we must do all the things we can, good or bad, ethical or unethical, to get our kids into those tiny number of good schools. And if that's the mindset that we have, we have done this to ourselves as a culture. But that's not what's out there. There are so many schools that can serve students so well. But we have to be willing to think about it in a bigger way, in a more open way. We have to be willing to think about those 49 other wild states out there. We have to be willing to say, I don't know anything about that school. And I think sometimes it's hard for parents. We're used to being the experts. We knew when to sign them up for scouts. We knew when to sign them up for CCD. We knew when to sign them up for baseball. We knew when to sign them up for all those things. And now, for many of us, college comes and we go, I don't know what to do. And it's hard to admit that. And that adds to that tension. But if you remember that you have lots of guidance, you have good counselors, you have lots of college reps who are good counselors. Everybody starts an admission really as admission counselors. That's part of what we do. And people are willing to help. They are willing to answer questions. They are willing to guide you. Um, so if you would allow that there's a lot out there, I think you'd be um, pleasantly surprised at what you'll find in unexpected places. Our website is uh, ctcl.org, Colleges That Change Lives, ctcl.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's just CTCL Colleges. And what I try to post is a lot of information about student successes, faculty student collaboration, the liberal arts, things that are happening for students, what employers are looking for, and how that meshes with what liberal arts colleges do. 
Um, and we will come back to this area with our large programs. We do uh, large programs in a lot of cities around the country, and we will be back here in this area. We'll be in Santa Clara at the, um, the Marriott in Santa Clara, and we will be in Marin County at the Marin Center. And that will be the very end of July, the very end, something like the 30th or 31st of July, 2020. And that will be up on our website very soon. If any of your students are on any mailing list from any of our institutions, you'll be re-invited and you'll know about it. And it'll be up on our website and our social media. And um, we'd love to have you to come to that. I will do an opening that will not be as long, but will be similar. And then you have the chance to talk to the reps, which is even more important. Um, and it's a great opening program if you haven't been to college programs with your kids before. It's a really nice opening program because all of our reps are incredibly welcoming. You'll never go to a table at one of our schools and, and kind of be, well, no, I don't think that, nah, you'll never get in. You don't get that kind of commentary from our reps, which I think is really nice. Um, they're always going to be as helpful as they can. And there's always the family that comes out at the end of the night and says, I had a really good time. And they're totally surprised. I, I really had fun. Huh. They're confused by that. Um, we think that this can be fun. You can hold on to your sense of humor in this process. I will tell you, I usually do this for students because I think it, it's comforting for them. Um, as I said, I'm a first generation student. Uh, my parents did not ask a lot of questions when we went to visit colleges, but my mother had one. And my mother's one question was, where is the hospital from here? So kids, if you're here and at some point your parents embarrass the heck out of you, you can think of me because it's been 40 years. I did that math the other day, which was a terrible idea. But it's been 40 years and I am still thinking, oh, ma, really? Really? You can hold on to your sense of humor. You can hold on to your sense of family in this process. Um, but it really is, it is a process and it is a discovery process of letting kids figure out who they are and not trying to make them someone they're not. There's a, there's a, a guy that I know in, in Miami who does work with students, and his thing is, you know, love the kid you got, not the, the one you wish you had. And so I think that if we can all remember that as we go into this search, it makes a big difference. I'm happy to take questions. I'm just going to step back there and get some water. <laughs> 